For 30 years, he made his way as an actor, both inside and outside of Hollywood. Despite the passion he put into his career, appearing in over 120 films, along with guest appearances on TV shows, his attention has always been attracted to the survival of wild animals in a world dominated by humans. Six years ago, he had a calling, an awakening, involving the tragedy facing the elephants of Africa. He felt compelled to do something about it. So off he went with notepad and camera to learn more. Today, his photographs of elephants in the wild are among the most remarkable photos of elephants you'll ever see. His name is Larry Laverty. Have you always had a connection with animals? Uh, yeah, that's getting right to the heart of the matter. It goes back to uh, some of my earliest memories in life. Uh, my parents had parakeets and they were right there in the uh, dining room, living room with us, and uh, they were frequently out of the cage, and Captain Kai Kai and Winky, and uh, they are just buddies, and I learned to, to respect um, other life besides humans because of them, because they're so delicate, tiny little mm -hmm. things, and that, and then uh, also playing in the, my mom's flower garden right outside the front door, waiting for butterflies to come through. Uh, I, I just um, gravitated to the natural world from the very beginning. So domesticated animals and wildlife, because you're outspoken when it comes to wildlife. So when did that mm -hmm. start in your life? Well, actually becoming a voice for wildlife uh, didn't really get going until the late 90s. Um, with the uh, buffalo up in Yellowstone. Uh, most people don't realize that there is a cull go that goes on every winter up in Yellowstone National Park or just outside it. And uh, so that bothered me because I grew up as a kid, like many families in this country, being taken by my parents to Yellowstone. And uh, yeah, it's fun seeing Old Faithful and all the uh, geological aspects, but for me, Yellowstone is about the animals. And when I learned that they were doing this to the buffalo, who are basically the most representative uh, animals of the park, I got pissed off. And uh, so I looked around, and the, fortunately, there's a conservation group, but it's the only one, the Buffalo Field Campaign. I just learned of them about a year after they started, and so uh, I started supporting them financially and then uh, speaking up for them and for the buffalo, and so that was the beginning. What about here in the Bay Area? Wildlife, were you attracted to wildlife here? Did you see wildlife growing up? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was always uh, by the nature of where my parents' home was, even though we were just off an interstate, we were in the hills, and so we'd have deer wandering through periodically and uh, always uh, raccoons and possums and, uh, cr and squirrels and uh, those little guys. Uh, so I appreciated them. A lot of people look at them as scary for one reason or another. And uh, just from the very beginning, I had a sympathy for them because they were in our environment. They were no longer in their natural world. That We were in houses all around and the freeway and lots of traffic, and yet they were still trying to live their lives that they had been living uh, and their ancestors for centuries. So I, I sympathize with them. What about elephants? You wouldn't have seen elephants here in Oakland. I didn't see many elephants uh, in Oakland, California, but I, I did know of the zoo that was uh, not far from my childhood home. They had elephants. And also the uh, circus would come to town, and of course, like every other family, uh, we'd all go down once a year to see the circus. And uh, the periodic traveling shows, they were kind of like carnivals, and they'd have wild animals and stuff. And I can remember, uh, it's a pretty early memory, um, outside one of these carnivals was a little baby elephant. I forget how much it was, but it cost a little money. You could little kids could ride on the back of the elephant. So uh, I have a very burnt in their memory of riding them. My dad uh, hoisted me up and I was riding on the back of a little baby elephant um, in my youth. So that was my first exposure. And uh, so it was a bit of a warped one as it is for 
most people, they think when they go to a zoo and they see elephants that they're actually seeing elephants, but they're just seeing an animal that's been uh, held in captivity and no longer able to do what they were born to do. They're, they're a shell of themselves. It's ironic, isn't it? Because the thing that makes us exploit them and hurt them the most is coming from a place of, I think, us wanting to be close to them and see them and connect with them and have a relationship with them, but it's mm. the very thing that also hurts them the most. Yeah, absolutely. It was a, an irony when I first really started paying attention to the interaction between animals and, and mankind that, that I thought, well, this is all very twisted and it just very much reflects how we human beings are. We're, uh, we're so focused on the human experience in being human, whether it's going to movies, watching TV, eating. It's all about experiencing being human and we haven't really put much attention on being uh, responsible beings in this world with all the other lives that we share that, and many of them are on four legs and, and restricted. Uh, they just haven't been able to do the things that we've been able to do since we have hands that we can we're free to invent and do all that we do. So yeah, it, it certainly is, uh, and that, that's the heartbreaking aspect of being on this planet with all these wild animals that we've lost touch with, uh, we've lost the connection with them and with what the world is, the natural world is all about. It's, we think what we see in the zoo or what we see on TV or in the movies, or maybe even for folks who maybe have made a trip to Africa once or twice, they're, they're still generally seeing some altered state um, because you go to the parks in Africa and you, the, all the animals have gotten used to all these vehicles circling around them with people chatting and shouting and uh, it's just it's an unfortunate thing that's taken place that we didn't learn to live in harmony on this planet with the uh, wildlife. Elephants in many ways symbolize what you're talking about because as you mentioned they're used in entertainment in zoos and circuses in mm -hmm. film etc mm -hmm. what do you think it is about elephants that makes people love them so much especially children what attracts us to elephants do you think uh, I think it's their unique appearance their size there's no other animal on this earth that looks like them but I think a lot of it starts when, with little children and uh, you see this animal with this cute trunk and he looks, he looks like everything is all swollen or something with these big legs, a big body, everything's kind of bulky. And because they're, they're not predators, they're, they're vegetarians, they don't hunt or kill, they're basically very gentle animals and so all of this lends itself to them being very attractive to, to children and young people. And so I think it starts at a very young age. I had a friend who uh, has joined me once I started speaking up for elephants. Uh, she was out all the time and until she passed away uh, trying to educate people. But I have a photograph. <laughs> I have a photograph of her as a uh, little girl holding, <laughs> holding a little elephant. So that was the beginning for her. <laughs> and what was the beginning for you? My beginning is quite, quite the extreme because I spent most of my life, um, like many of the people that I'm critical of today, uh, focused on myself, focused on my own goals in life. Uh, I was too preoccupied with what I wanted to do for a career, too preoccupied with athletics. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a poster child of the very people that I'm so upset with uh, today. But I'm grateful that I became enlightened and so it's kind of become uh, my mission to, to try to enlighten other people.
for me, it was just a story of going about my life. I would, uh, I would uh, read the newspaper, and because of my business as an actor, I would, uh, I would read the obituaries to get an idea of what other people were doing in, with their lives and to learn and file that away into, uh, into my mind for the characters that I'd be playing throughout my career. And one day as I was going through the paper on my way to the obituary for that day, I came upon a little blurb saying that the uh, Oakland Zoo was endorsing uh, the first global march for elephants. And uh, I, I had a small connection to the zoo because my first grade teacher, who I remained friends with since elementary school, clear until she reached the age of 100, she, she had worked as a docent for 20 plus years at the zoo, so that was my connection, why the zoo, what the zoo said meant anything to me. And so uh, it weighed on me, I thought, wow, what's that all about? And uh, I ended up going to, to over to San Francisco and marching with everybody else on this uh, day, over a thousand of us. Um, it's the only march that I know of where where humans have have spoken up to that degree, and in those numbers, on behalf of an animal, not not for human beings. No, this was this was speaking up for elephants, because of the uh, ivory trade, and uh, all the killing that went on, so that ivory could be uh, peddled throughout Asia in particular. So this kept weighing on me after the march. It just kept it kept sitting on me that not only did I have a curiosity about elephants, but uh, <clears throat> the uh, injustice. I come from a family full of veterans and a, and a few law enforcement people, and I thought, this is not right. This is just plain. So from those two angles, I was fed. I was inspired and motivated. And um, I just kept kept exploring and, and I kept learning all I could about elephants uh, through online sources and books and and I became this uh, outspoken advocate in social media and then people started saying well you I wish you I wish you'd do more uh, in one case they asked me if I'd come back to Washington DC and speak and I weighed that for a day or two and I felt particularly unqualified because I'd never seen an elephant in the wild. I didn't know what elephants really were. And so I declined, and then the very next day I bought my ticket and made an arrangement with uh, a travel agency to make my first trip to Africa. So that was the beginning of, of the mission that has just continued to evolve and go deeper and deeper. So you knew already when you went that it would be capturing them um, with your camera? Well, that was part of the thought process to prepare because I, I never in my life thought I would go to Africa. I thought if I'm going all the way to the other side of the earth, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take pictures while I'm there. And uh, so I, I took my camera with me and, and I, wasn't, I was totally unprepared. I missed more shots than I saw, that I got. Uh, but with each successive trip, I kept adding to my equipment until I have this ridiculous amount of cameras when I go over now. So you were already interested in photography when you went. So when did you get interested in photography? Yeah, that, that goes back to my youth also. It was, a, it was a, when I was five years old. For Christmas, my parents gave me this little plastic, uh, it's actually a, lord, a large format camera. So at age five, I started uh, playing around with uh, the camera and I was, I had good, teachers because both of my parents were photographers uh, as hobbies and they drove me crazy taking pictures of my <clears throat> of my childhood and my brother and sister and everything had to be documented and my dad was actually very good at it and so uh, I learned a little bit about light and a little bit about moments and how to watch for them and uh, so it just kept growing from there to the point where I was having a little trouble with my career after I'd gotten it off the ground as an actor. I, I thought, well, I'll supplement it with uh, photojournalism. So I went out and bought a bunch of uh, 
professional equipment at that point. Uh, but then my career took off. And so the camera just sat in a box for a while. This is a film camera, shooting film. And uh, then, then when I became activated on behalf of the elephants and, and made this first trip, then I had to buy all new equipment, digital. And uh, so, yeah, I could, I could buy two or three cars with what I've spent on camera equipment at this point. But. That's one of the gifts the elephants gave you then, is actually reinvigorating your oh, love of photography. Very much. Uh, it's my desire to speak up for them has been enhanced by the fact that, yes, I had this connection to photography from a young age. And then <clears throat> what started separating my experience was not only was I photographing them, but I was writing about elephants. And so that took me into uh, applying something that started early as a writer. I come from a family of writers. My, my great aunt was one of the early uh, female journalists in this country. And she became an international correspondent. And uh, I just, um, it's, it's in me to write. I, th I was thinking these pictures are not enough. I want, to, I want to share more of my experience and what I've learned about elephants in written form. And I, I just, uh, again, it's in my blood. And it was also, uh, I just started writing at an early age. I was on the junior high school newspaper. And I was supposed to write for the high school newspaper, but I got distracted by other things. And then I wrote uh, along the way when I started spending time between bouncing between uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles in my career. I started writing for this uh, local paper published here in Oakland that served about a quarter of Oakland. I, I actually took over a column that my dad was writing. I, I first ghost was a ghost writer for him when he went blind, and then uh, just took over the column full time. And uh, so all of this was cultivating skills I needed to, to be a better uh, voice for the elephants. So skills and passion. So your passion for elephants, your passion for photography, mm. your passion for writing. Mm. That's what motivated you then to write your book and create your book on elephants? Uh, in a way, but I'm, I'm, a reluctant, uh, I'm a reluctant participant in the book because I, I thought uh, I never conceived in my life of doing a book. Uh, just wasn't something I could imagine. And, and yet, uh, as I kept over a period of years, kept putting out my photos and little recollections and, and thoughts about elephants, I, I began after a few years getting these uh, suggestions. You should do a book. You should do a book. And I just kind of chuckled it off. And, but finally I thought, yeah, I can reach more people with a book. So I'm, I'm all about reaching people with information about elephants. It's not about me. I don't need to write a book to do a book. I, I, I need to get the word out about elephants. and so. I, I, I took the bait and, and, and did, I began working on, on it. But that only brought me then to thinking, well, I have to put forth my best effort in this book. So I was just starting to think, well, maybe I've seen as much of Africa as I need to see to know about elephants, but <clears throat> I needed to get a better representation because there's two species of elephants in Africa and there's actually three different um, I don't know, I guess you could call types of elephants over there, the desert elephants and the savanna elephants and the forest elephants. I thought, well, I have to represent all of them. So I had to keep going back and going deeper and deeper into Africa to find uh, what I needed to find. <laughs> and so that's, this led to going to 10 African countries and all, and uh, months and months out into the bush, going farther into places, uh, places where my life was actually at risk. And I, I would, on some days, I would think, whoa, is this, is this worth it? What if, what if uh, bandits jump out in front of us uh, around the next corner and maybe I'm shot dead as, as other people had been in the not too recent past? I thought, hmm. But then after I processed that, then there was just, there's no question. It's one of the things I love about your photographs. The photographs speak for themselves, but I love that you also have the text that 
-hmm. educates people, raises awareness, inspires people, mm -hmm. and teaches people about these incredible animals. Mm -hmm. What do you think makes your photography so special? What do you think draws people to it? Uh, I think because of acting, I, I know what a moment in life is. I know, I know what a moment in life is. That, and so I, I then started to have to, I had to shift from watching humans, studying them, to studying elephants who have different behaviors, obviously, than human beings do. And so it's the uh, the moment, and I and during the period where I was uh, flirting with the photojournalism, I did a lot of street photography, and and so I just started training my. You just have to be very quick when you're walking the streets of San Francisco, in particular, as I did for weeks on end, because <clears throat> the moments come and go so quickly. They happen and they pass, and so I trained my eye to watch for those and and capture them. And so that's that is what I believe is what people are enjoying most is the is that. And then I have uh, I've also been a filmmaker in my life, so I've cultivated my sense of composition, different artistic elements. So you talked about reluctantly going to Africa because you were drawn there and compelled to go. But what was it like being there and being among the elephants and getting ready for your book? That has been a, a, a collection of experiences that has continued to deepen. The more time you spend with anybody, anything, you realize the, the subtleties, the intricacies. And I'd think about it when I'd return home how can I make the next trip better? How can I make my photographs better? And I just kept refining it to the point where each trip, uh, even if I saw elephants, uh, if the light wasn't right or they were too sedentary, I'd move on. Keep looking, keep moving. And uh, so that's, that's the, one of the keys uh, to getting good photographs also is just keep moving until you bump into something that's captivating. Can you share a story of a particular moment that was arresting for you that was just I mean, magical? Any, any stories from when you were in Africa? My mind, my mind un, unfortunately goes to human mm -hmm. incidents that uh, like a UN peacekeeper being killed at the same location I was uh, the day after I was there. Things like that, I, that's what comes to my mind, unfortunately. I kinda, that, that might be a reflection on how humans might, we tend to uh, remember, remember, put too much emphasis on the negative things in life, uh, and they can start boxing us in. Uh, but uh, not to be focused on that <laughs> as an exercise. Um, oh. Yeah, that's another <laughs> one. One incident was in uh, Central African Republic. <clears throat> Probably my favorite place to photograph elephants because there's a an opening uh, within the jungle, the rainforest, the Congo rainforest, uh, where the elephants gather because there's minerals and water there, two things that are necessary for them to survive. So they'll come out of the woods and they'll travel for miles to get to this place. Uh, but two or three years before I was there, uh, I believe they came from Sudan. Ivory hunters came there. They were, they were uh, yeah, they were part of that whole thing taking place up in Sudan. They, but they'd heard about this clearing in the, in the jungle. So they came and stood on the very ground that I stood and mowed down 20, 26 elephants took their tusks back to Sudan where they could buy uh, arms and ammunition. But two or three years later, you would hear a crack in the trees, maybe a monkey. A monkey grabbed a branch and the branch broke, or even just uh, something like that, and the elephants would run for their lives. Something about seeing the biggest land animal on earth running for its life um, more memorable 
sadly, <laughs> then then all the all the sights of the little babies, and uh, the lines of elephants going across uh, Amboseli. Uh, yeah, I hate to say that moments like that, and I have others that dominate my memory now. But um, you know, it goes without saying. I, I, I transferred the, the, the word goober to the little baby elephants, and it, it, I'm never tired of seeing and watching. I, sp I could spend all day watching baby elephants, especially if two families, family groups come together. Mm. That's uh, those endless, in, in every location I went, uh, endless uh, appreciation watching that uh, joy for life that playfulness uh, yeah watching that in action it's uh, it's as good as it gets so you sound like you're really present there a lot of photographers will talk about the fact that they didn't realize they were there until they saw their photographs later on and then mm. they realize oh my gosh i got that shot you sound like you're really present, you're really there. Do you, do you, are you watching through your camera the whole time or are you watching them outside of the camera and then you know when to look through your lens? My idea is to watch and I always have the camera ready and I always have, uh, if I'm in a vehicle between my legs, I have uh, four cameras, four bodies, four lenses of all different ranges depending on how close uh, that I can reach into. Uh, when I'm anticipating something that I want to photograph and and I'll do handheld. I trust the technology, the uh, the ability of these new cameras to reduce the vibration. So even with my big 600 millimeter lens, I'll handhold that and um, watch for the moment. It's just all about uh, watching for the moment and then if they're if they're in a in a circumstance where something may take place, then I ask, then I'll hold it up. And so I'm anticipating, but I'll only fire it off a frame at a time. I don't. I don't even fire more than a frame at a time. Well, that's incredible. You get to really appreciate it and capture them. Well, I, I know exactly what I'm looking for, and occasionally I'll catch maybe a blink of an eye if they're, you know. <laughs> but other than that, and I, I know their behavior well enough now to be able to anticipate pretty thoroughly. So. So yeah, that's, that's just how I go about it that way. And, and I try to get out of the vehicle as often as possible. There's a lot of parks, like parks in the United, United States to a degree, where you have to remain in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. But that, that's why I like going into conservation areas, uh, aside from the parks of Africa, where you can go on foot and uh, get near them. Uh, but I try not to go too close. As far as I'm concerned, you're, if you're getting close, you're altering their behavior. And I've had circumstances where I've watched another vehicle completely upset a situation, whether it's a little baby nursing or just, a, I, I don't want to be a part of that. I'd rather not go. I'd rather stay home and go over there and be another person influencing the behavior of the surviving elephants in the last remaining places they have. Because I, I think one misconception I had all along was that Africa was teeming with wildlife, that everywhere you went, elephants and giraffes and rhinos were roaming around and somehow the people got along. Well, it's actually the other way around, that somehow the wildlife, all these iconic animals are somehow surviving in spite of us all being over there and the uh, native population of Africa exploding and taking up all the land with their uh, livestock and their crops and leaving very little for the elephants and all the other wildlife. And so uh, I respect the space that they have and uh, I stay as far back as I can and still be able to use my lenses effectively. But the key, that's another Thing how I think my images are different than other photographers is that the elephants are doing behaviors, they're, they're, they're living their lives not influenced by my being there. That's something I just try to bear in mind that I do not want to contribute 
to the human impact on these surviving elephants and other wildlife over there. So when people get your book, and they will, because it's absolutely stunning, what do you want people to do with what they see? Well, it was my hope in putting it together that uh, I thought I would have two audiences, one being <clears throat> people like myself who already have uh, a strong bond with elephants and are involved in the conservation effort, that I would somehow inspire them uh, to do more, to contribute more, to be a, a bigger voice. Um, like I know there are other people like myself. I will wear uh, like a pendant with an elephant on it, or I have uh, jewelry and I'll, I'll flaunt that in public and kind of <laughs> to try to stimulate a conversation. Uh, and then I get to inject you know, by the way, did you know that this is what the elephants are really facing in Africa and that we all should care more? So one is to work with the uh, people who are already conservation-minded, like myself, to encourage them to, to give more, to speak up more. Then there's a group of people who, who love wildlife. They like elephants but they've never been to Africa, and for one reason or another, whether it's financial or they're handicapped or something, they'll never go, they'll never be able to go. And then there are the people who know nothing, um, basically as I did uh, 10 years ago, people who know nothing about elephants. So if, I, if, if a person knows nothing about a subject, how can they care? And so that's, that's the mission of the book, and it's kind of threefold, but I'm preaching to the choir <laughs> in one respect, and then I'm trying to reach people who, who were like myself and, and help them realize that they're all the things. That, I mean, the, title, the subtitle of the book is The Plight and Preservation of the African Elephant, and that's, that sums it up. It's to illuminate the, the challenges that they face over there to this day, the few that are still left. And then how are we going to address that? How are we going to save? How are we going to preserve? How, how are we going to ensure that future generations of humans will have a, a rich place that we call planet Earth and not some barren place where there's just nothing but humans marching around, doing whatever we feel like. Well, even for the choir, I think what is so beautiful about your photography is that it will inspire people, I think, to speak on elephants' behalf, but it also celebrates mm. their beauty, their relationships, their intelligence, their compassion, and that, that's really special, and I, I, for one, am very grateful for that. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Colleen. Yeah, the... Uh, the, when I, uh, an aspect of that is that because we're, those of us in the conservation effort are so on alert for what's taking place uh, to elephants presently, and of course this can apply to the, the people in the world who love lions and the people who love giraffes, uh, they're all facing the same challenges, more or less. And, um, the idea is that we're, we're immersed in this world where all the news we get is bad. We learn about, okay, poachers just took out another dozen elephants in wherever, some country or another. And uh, elephants in India got hit by a train, or um, it's just bad news. There's so much bad news for wildlife, um, primarily because of the impact of humans on the, on the world. And, so I, I try to be a celebration of the lives of elephants. And so while I will, especially in social media, I will call attention to current stories, events in the news. Uh, like presently, there were six elephants in India that went over a waterfall. And it all started with a baby. The baby went over and the, and the other elephants tried to save that baby. So. You know, it's a big downer for all of us who, who care. But uh, I try to offset that and not have us bogged down and to, to remember what we're fighting for, the positive, the 
positive things. And that's, that's where, um, that with the book, uh, the images would be the elephants through a rose-colored glass. This is the life of an elephant. And so they're all flattering with the exception of one bull elephant in Namibia that had been killed by another ele elephant in a fight. With the exception of that, it's all celebrating the life. And then in, within the text, then I would talk more about the, what the challenges are. What are your favorite places to photograph? Where, where do you love to go? Uh, I, could, I, I, th I think I could say just about every place. <laughs> every place I've been where there's elephants is my favorite mm -hmm. place. Uh, a few in terms of the stark contrast. Uh, Namibia, witnessing the desert adapted elephants. And these are, these are just savanna elephants like you would see over in uh, East Africa. <clears throat> but they've adapted their lives to living with very little, very little water, very little food. And they're out under these uh, stark conditions. Uh, if you think of the desert, uh, this, is, this is what much of Namibia looks like. It's some of the most picturesque desert on the, on the face of the earth. And Hollywood movies have been over there shooting in recent years because it's just so... So to see an elephant in this uh, moonscape is... Uh, you just have to shake your head. And, then, and, and to see lions in the same place, you think, how, how, number one, how do they survive? How did they get here? And this looks very surreal to me. I mean, it'd be no different if Neil Armstrong first saw uh, an elephant on the moon when he landed there. It, that's how impressive it is that, that life exists out there. So that would be one place. And then I think the other extreme would be within the Congo rainforest in, in the jungle. And uh, that could be in the Central African Republic. It could be in Uganda. It could be in a couple other countries. But um, to be in a place where suddenly you round the corner on a trail, or if you're walking up a stream bed, which is often the easiest way to get around, is walk, just follow the course of water because trails don't last, uh, or it's too heavily vegetated, and you suddenly come around the bend and you, you hear a crack, and it's not a monkey. It's a great big elephant. And um, so to, f to, to have that kind of perspective on an elephant in this very restrictive environment for movement and for sight, uh, compared to most people's uh, impressions of Africa, they'll probably see elephants in Kenya or South Africa or someplace where they're, where they're out in the open more. And that, I think, is most people, if they have an impression of Africa, that's, that's what they think of. So those, those two vastly different environments, uh, habitats, are what, what stick out in my mind for being favorites. Because with the Central African Republic in particular, Every day from the camp, had to drive an hour over the, some of the worst roads on planet Earth, then hike for just under an hour with my 40 pounds of equipment on my back, going through streams, going through the jungle. And uh, you're rewarded by this gathering place. Uh, so those, those would be my two, if I could say two favorite places. <clears throat> Those would be it, but I, I have sentimental places because of uh, local people that I've befriended. And uh, the landscape, uh, these, are, these two places are in Kenya. Uh, and so I, I think of those places and I, I always hesitate to publicize these places because I like keeping them to myself. <laughs> but there's a place called the Chulu Hills and, and you fly from Nairobi in a, in a bush plane, and you're just transported. You're, you're in one of the largest, fastest growing cities, densest on the planet. You leave that <clears throat> Nairobi and you end up landing on an airstrip that's nothing but uh, volcanic dust and at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro. Whew. So then being able to see elephants in that kind of environment is... Uh, yeah, that, that's a sentimental 
favorite, this place in the Chulu Hills for me. You light up when you talk about it. It's lovely. What do you get out of your campaign for elephants? How does it satisfy you? I, I have to say, and I think it's probably true for almost every person, uh, probably yourself included, that takes animal life here on Earth uh, to heart, that this can be the most heartbreaking pursuit or um, attachment in life to have. It's heartbreaking. That's what, <laughs> that's what, I, how I have been influenced. Um, and so it's, from the beginning it wasn't about what was in it for me. I felt like, I felt like I was on some mission that I had, I got it out of my system. Okay, I had this career that completely absorbs you. You have to develop your craft, which can take years, <clears throat> and then you have to be your own marketer, and you have to trust that your agent and your managers and all of those other people that are on your team are going to work on your behalf. And so it's very self-absorbing. <clears throat> I think maybe I had gotten that all out of me, that my appreciation of animal life and wildlife in particular, uh, as they try to coexist with us here on this planet we dominate, that uh, I, this is all about them. It might be similar, I never had children in life, it might be similar to parents who are willing to give up anything for their children, anything. That's uh, what, the way I operate with the elephants. I'm, it's, there's nothing that I particularly take because again, the things that wash over me on a daily basis are, are not, not uplifting because the life of elephants and all wildlife is so challenged these days. Uh, if anything, it's, it's when I see a person who didn't know a thing, or like I've, I've been an activist, an animal, act, animal rights activist since I got involved in this. So I'm one of those people that you see protesting out in front of the circus, protesting out in front of, uh, any place where animals are being wronged, like when we tried to uh, eliminate the bull hook as a way of getting the circuses, getting, stopping them from coming here. And then anything regarding ivory, speaking up uh, against the ivory trade. Uh, when I see somebody who has an aha moment, like a few people, only a few, once they've seen the video, uh, that is um, on display uh, with with this fellow who I am out there or have been out there protesting with the most. Once they see that and they start reading on the uh, flyers that we hand out, they have turned around. That that is poof. So when somebody has a realization that. Uh, that is good. And then also when somebody says, I didn't know elephants did that. And people who have made trips to Africa learn something new or see something different. Because again, I've, I've made it a point to go to all these different corners of Africa. And a lot of people don't or can't go as deep into the remote parts. And so when they see something that they didn't know existed, that's also rewarding. Because it broadened their, um, their appreciation. Well, now you're moving on to Asian elephants, which is new for you. And Asian elephants are more endangered. Are they more endangered than African elephants? Why do we hear so little about Asian elephants? Yeah, well, for every 10 elephants in Africa, there's about one left in Asia. In the wild? Uh, altogether. The, when, for me, now that I've started on this, so I have my book out on the African elephants. I, before I even finished it, I thought, okay, my natural next step is to go to Asia. I thought, I have to go. I have to do a book about the Asian elephants. It's a whole different species of elephant. And so by their nature, they're a little bit more uh, manageable uh, by man. And so that's worked against them. So elephants in captivity is basically what elephants in Asia is all about. There are still national parks over there with wild elephants in them, but when you start 
talking and exploring Asia to learn about elephants, you are going to be bumping into elephants in captivity in one form or another. I've already made one trip to Sri Lanka and, and I'm, I'll, I'll do 10. I want to have an ample survey. Uh, again, I spend uh, just under a month at each of, in each of these countries, so I'm, I'm not getting as much as somebody who may live there for years, but with fresh eyes and a very intensive, <laughs> I'm out there every day from dawn till dusk. I'll get a good representation of, of what is going on over there for elephants. And so uh, this will be another two or three years off. It'll take me that long to collect and to get it to all the places I want. I want to go into China, where there are still a few hundred left. There are still a few remote pockets in China. And uh, so, yeah, uh, and I'll be writing this winter, uh, start on the first chapter. and then uh, work on that. So yeah, that's, uh, that's around the bend. There's only more and more to do from my standpoint. It's like I could, uh, I'm st I still have a little bit of my career going, so that's a distraction. I, I just have some other irons in the fire, but I could, I could spend all day, every day, uh, working on this problem in one way or another, even if I would just go over and be a spotter on an anti-poaching patrol. It's, it's just uh, to try to do what we can, those of us who care and can, not everybody can get over there. You have to be hopeful because you wouldn't be able to do this otherwise. Something drives you in terms of the solutions that are being put in place now, the solutions mm -hmm. that can be put in place. What do you see, what do you see as, um, as what's working in terms of um, the plight of elephants in Africa? Yeah, thankfully there's a, a nice little list of things that are working for elephants in Africa. And it all goes to a good couple of dozen organizations that are already uh, up and running over there. Some, of, some have a pretty good uh, long run so far. And each of these groups, uh, and they, they tend to be in, <laughs> in several of the, the most populous countries. So some of these countries, uh, to start at that, that the higher level, have uh, family planning in place, or an, at least uh, encouraging it. And then moving to the conservation groups themselves, those are who we want to support. They're working with the local communities to help them appreciate the value of elephants, and also to uh, find a way just in their day-to-day -day operations of working with their livestock, working with their crops, uh, to keep the elephants wild and not to alter their behavior. Then the, the conservation groups are also working with uh, in anti-poaching operations, and those anti-poaching operations overlap with the community building, because they realize that uh, the beginning of many poachers' careers starts with the fact that they're desperate for money to feed their family. You have that, and then you have a there's one or two groups, one in particular, that operates in several parks over there, several countries, called African Parks. And they will take a derelict park, a park that has been completely wiped out of wildlife, where no tourists go anymore. It's just become a land for hoodlums, and, and it's just barren. They will take that land over, reintroduce populations of all wildlife, They'll build new roads, they'll build new camps, they'll even advertise uh, in the, within the tourism industries around the world to let people know, we have this place, come and visit us. And so these are things that are taking place, but as you can imagine in Africa, there's just more and more that could be done. So that's where um, the more support from the rest of us, in little Oakland, California, or wherever we may be, we send off a check for five bucks, 50 bucks, whatever we can afford, that will have a very positive impact over there. And, and we, can, we can feel increasingly hopeful. And especially, there's just something that comes from doing that. Instead of wringing your hands with the latest news you've had, I just sent a check off to somebody and they will do something good with it. 
I agree. I love that. I love that. And, and your book is that beacon of hope. And thank you for including those organizations in your book. The good news and the bad news is there's a lot to do. And there's a lot we can do. Mm -hmm. So everyone has an opportunity. Everyone has a voice. And um, thank you for being a voice for mm. wildlife in general and elephants in particular. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful that I really have no choice. I have no choice but to be a voice. Thank you. And thank you for all you do. You do have a choice. I think it's important to say that you do have a choice and we all have a choice. I often say that it's not that we, people who ask like, do you really think we can make a difference? My answer is no, I don't think we can make a difference. I know we do make a difference. Everything we do has an impact. Mm -hmm. Everything we buy, everything we do, every, everything we do in our lives has an impact. We don't get to decide whether we can make a difference or not. We get to decide only if the difference we make is negative or positive. So mm -hmm. you do have a choice and I thank you for the choice you're making. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm inclined to rebut because I truly am that possessed. It's a, it's, it's a possession. It's some su supernatural passion that has taken me over that I, 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 I wouldn't be able to get up in the morning and ignore. And, and again, I, I, feel, I feel inclined intuitively. I feel inclined spiritually. And I wish I could say that it was a choice, that I could leave it, like take a day off. Could I just take a day off? And, but I can't. Anyway, I, I, I understand exactly what you're saying and, and how it's, uh, I think, for most human beings to, to make the right choice for certain. And, and sometimes you will evolve into this place where you are like me, where I, I surrendered myself uh, to something bigger than me. I understand. And hopefully people who get your book will feel the same way and be compelled to make a difference for elephants. There really is such an opportunity for us to do so. And again, I think your book is a, is a real opportunity and channel for, for that, for, for others. Mm -hmm. So you will, you will compel them to be as, <laughs> as obsessed and inspired as you are. Thank you. Here's to that. Here's to it. <laughs>